All right, let's talk about narcolepsy. Okay, um, I've got a link there to a video that will show you what I mean by sleep attacks. And uh, again, just sh um, run the, the PowerPoints that I provided as a slideshow. Click on that link and it will take you to the YouTube video that will show you the um, sleep attacks. It's actually goats. It's kind of mean to laugh at it, but it is kind of funny. <laughs> so, um, so with narcolepsy, the idea is that any kind of physiological arousal, laughing, anger, being startled, um, can kick you over. Oh wait, that, that link, actually I changed the links. It's no longer a goat. It's a girl who has narcolepsy and her boyfriend startles her to trigger, trigger her to go into um, her narcoleptic fit. The thing about narcolepsy is that it kicks you immediately over into REM sleep. So you go from a person who's awake and alert to instantly, within seconds, you've lapsed direct, directly into REM sleep. One of the th implications of being in REM sleep is that you're really hard to wake up. You know, you've got sleep paralysis, you're deeply asleep, it's really hard to wake you up. So these attacks can last you know, three, four, five minutes of basically unresponsiveness. And a person who's got narcolepsy will collapse into, you know, like fall. And so you, if you're talking with your friend standing up and um, start laughing really hard, you could collapse onto the ground and, and be in REM sleep. If you're driving your car and get startled, you could collapse into a narcoleptic REM stage and um, you crash your car. So it's it's a pretty dangerous disorder and it's probably not nice to startle your girlfriend and make her lapse into her narcoleptic REM stage, um, but it is kind of funny for us to watch it. Um, so the idea in narcolepsy is that you collapse into REM. Now you notice it has that word lepsy at the end, the little suffix, um, which sounds a lot like epilepsy. It's a brain malfunction that triggers the part of your brain that normally causes you to transition into REM sleep while you're while you are asleep. It, there's a malfunction that causes that little nucleus to misfire and just cause you to go immediately into REM sleep. Um, so that's why it has that lepsy in there. It's a little brain malfunction. Sleep apnea has gotten a lot of attention lately so that when I first started teaching this class a million years ago. Nobody had heard of sleep apnea. Nobody knew what it was. Now most of you probably know what sleep apnea is, but you might you might be mistaken in what you think it is. Um, I've got a, another video of somebody who's suffering from sleep apnea, and you'll um, you'll hear their snoring and what it sounds like. The idea in sleep apnea, a means no, and nia means breathing. So periodically while you're sleeping, you stop breathing. A lot of people who have sleep apnea have snoring as a, as a side effect, as sort of a symptom of their sleep apnea. So you hear them snoring and it gets like progressively more um, closed off sounding. So you hear them going <coughs> and then there's silence while the person is not breathing. And this can go on for up to a minute, probably more, where while the um, CO2 is starting to build up in their blood system, once it gets high enough, it'll cause them to snort themselves awake and struggle and then fall back asleep. The thing about sleep apnea is that it tends to occur during REM sleep. So as your body is becoming paralyzed, your uh, um, soft palate, your throat also becomes paralyzed and starts to collapse down and block your airway. Um, it's more common the older we get because you know as we get older we tend to gain weight and fatty tissue gets deposited around our throats. Um, also our muscles become more lax in general as we age so the typical sleep apnea patient is at least 30 pounds overweight and tends to be over 40 because, you know, as we get older, it's more likely. Um, but it's not restricted to people who are over 40 and at least 30 pounds overweight. It's just that's the most common sufferer. Um, there are different kinds of sleep apnea, which are um, the upper airway type, which is literally where your soft palate and throat closes on you while you're in REM sleep. 
and that produces a lot of snoring when you have the upper airway type. There's also the central type, which is actually caused by your medulla failing to send a message to your diaphragm to move up and down while you're sleeping. Remember, the medulla is in charge of heartbeat and respiration, and it takes care of your unconscious respiration. But if it misfires, it won't you won't breathe. Now most of us go through a period of time each night when we aren't breathing. All of us do it. Like we'll take six to ten seconds at a stretch, maybe up to thirty seconds, and it's fairly normal. Most of us just do it once or twice a night. A person who has sleep apnea, their medulla is misfiring for much longer periods of time and much more frequently. Um, the thing about the central type is that there may not be any snoring associated with it. It could be that you're completely breathing normally, um, you know, sounding, but you just periodically stop breathing. And that's the silent killer type of sleep apnea. The person just stops breathing. In fact, some researchers think that sudden infant death syndrome, or what you might have heard of called um, crib death, might be due to sleep apnea in babies who are born prematurely in particular, and their medulla is not fully mature. And so they're, um, it just stops. It, it doesn't always consistently tell them to breathe. Uh, the worst kind of sleep apnea probably would be if you have the combination where you have upper airway, so you're snoring a lot, plus the central type, so you've got the medulla f malfunctioning. Because a lot of times people will get treated, maybe get a Breathe Right strip, or do something, um, go to the sleep clinic and, and get, um, uh, there's a type of surgery where they can remove some of the fatty tissue in your throat and stuff. You treat the snoring, and meanwhile, you still have the central sleep apnea that may be a, be a very silent killer. So it's really important that a person get diagnosed correctly if they um, have sleep apnea, and particularly if they're snoring. Sleep apnea can cause a higher risk of stroke and um, heart attacks because you're depriving your body of, of oxygen. Now, another sleep type of sleep disorder that happens outside of REM is night terrors. Night terrors are, and again, I've got a video for you if you want to watch it. Um, you can click on that from the PowerPoint slide. Um, night terrors are not nightmares. Nightmares happen during REM sleep. They are dreams. Your body's paralyzed and you have a dream. And it's scary. Night terrors happen during non-REM stage three. And in a, in a night terror, you misinterpret what is around you. Your eyes come open, so it looks like you're awake, and then you're looking around and your eyes are collecting information, but your brain is misinterpreting what your eyes are seeing. So you wake up, you look over at your partner sleeping in the bed next to you, and you interpret that person as an attacker or an animal or something, and so you start punching your partner. Uh, because you're terrified. You're like, oh my god, there's a bear in the bed, and so you start punching it. Um, that's the kind of thing that happens with night terrors. Night terrors, because they happen outside of REM sleep and you're not paralyzed, you can get up and act them out. And so with your eyes open, you can move through the environment, interpreting it through the, the lens of your confused brain. Some people think what's going on with night terrors is that you are dreaming outside of REM stage, and that without the protective paralysis, you're getting up and doing stuff, um, and that it really is just a malfunction where you're dreaming in the wrong stage. Whatever it is, it's a scary, scary experience. Um, the person is completely in fear for their lives during a night terror, and it's completely real at the time for them. Um, I'm going to add on here sleepwalking, because sleepwalking is like, everything I said about night terror is true for sleepwalking too, except for that you're not scared necessarily while you're doing it. In sleepwalking, you might get up and go eat, <laughs> you might, um, you my, I, I don't know if this is an inappropriate story to tell, so, well, might as well tell it. My brother, when he was little, um, when we first moved to our new house, uh, he got up in the middle of the night and went and peed in the breakfast nook <laughs> because he was sleepwalking. And his little brain came to the conclusion this was the bathroom, I guess. And uh, that's what the kind of thing that happens in sleepwalking. Your eyes are open, you can see what's around you, but you misinterpret what you're experiencing. But sleepwalking, you're not terrified. Night terrors, you are. 
Are these people dreaming? I'm not sure. My brother was a famous sleepwalker, so I will tell another brother story from that same house. Uh, he got, got up one night about an hour and a half after he had gone to bed, maybe three hours, um, maybe, maybe, you know, hour and a half to three hours, something like that. Got up, jumped out his bedroom window, which thankfully we only had a, a one-story house, and then he ran between the two houses, which my parents at that time were just getting ready to go to bed. So they hear somebody go running between the houses, and the grass was long and stuff, so they heard him go rustling through the grass. And they're like, oh, who's out between our houses? That was weird. Then they hear their front door open, which I guess back in my childhood, people let their doors unlocked. So he comes through the front door, and my dad's like, oh my gosh, somebody's coming through the front door. And, and like I said, they, my parents were getting ready for bed, so apparently my dad was completely naked. And so... Uh, He's going to defend his family, so he grabs a, a weapon, a wire coat hanger, and he goes out to f confront the intruder, which turned out to be my brother, who was sleepwalking. And apparently he had jumped out the window, run between the houses, come back in the front door, and was still asleep when my dad encountered him in the hallway, led him back to his bed, and he went back to, back to bed. In the morning, we asked him about it, and he didn't really know what was going on. He really didn't know what he had done. And that's really typical of people who have had night terrors or have sleptwalked, is that in the morning, they don't remember it. The people around them remember it. The people who were awake or startled awake by the blood-curdling scream of the person in the night terror, those people remember what happened, and they're shaken up by it. Um, but the the sleeper doesn't really remember it, so it doesn't tend to have um, long-term effects. They aren't supposed to be dreaming in the way that we talk about dreaming. So they're in non-REM stage three. So they're not having a REM stage sleep at least, but they may be having sort of some kind of hallucination-ish kind of, they're, they're definitely in a different mindset though. Um, what I wanted to mention about sleepwalking and night terrors is that a lot of times people think that, uh, that these can be symptoms of trauma, that the sleeper must have experienced some trauma and now they're having nightmares that are really intense. Um, that's not necessarily true, especially not for little kids. Uh, night terrors and sleepwalking are very common in like toddlers all the way up into adolescence. A lot of research has shown that as your brain is undergoing a lot of cognitive development very rapidly, you're more likely to have a night terror or sleepwalk. So a toddler who's going through a series of night terrors, waking up in the middle, you know, I shouldn't say middle of the night, they usually wake up about an hour and a half, two hours after they've gone to bed. They sit up and they scream, and then when mom and dad run in there to comfort their toddler, the toddler tries to fight them off like they're a wild animal, and their eyes are wild, they look crazy. Um, and the parents are usually pretty disturbed by this. They're like, what is going on in our toddler's life that they're having this kind of horrible, horrible night terror? Well, it, more than likely, their toddler is experiencing some kind of cognitive jump. They're about to start talking, or they're um, suddenly understanding self-awareness, or something like that. Um, if you're an adult, and you haven't got, had a history of night terrors across your lifespan, but you suddenly have started having night terrors, or you've just suddenly started sleepwalking, those things can be a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder if it's something new. Um, if you've been doing it your whole life and it's a return, it just indicates that you're probably just under stress in general. Um, people who, who sleptwalked or experienced night terrors when they were younger They'll usually, they'll go away in adolescence, and then when you get back into adulthood and have a, a stressful sequence of days, you know, like a, a protracted period of stressful time, or you're sleeping in an unusual place, or um, you've been drinking, these can trigger a return of night terrors or sleepwalking. So it's not always a symptom of something bad. It can be a symptom of just like, um, acute stress right now. It could be a symptom of having been drinking or um, that you're just in a strange place. So uh, parents need to be really careful about, you know, just assuming that their child must have been molested or something and, or else they wouldn't be having these n night terrors. It's probably just cognitive development that they're experiencing. It's ter terrifying for the parents. And you know how in the Bugs Bunny cartoons they always say, you know, don't wake up a sleepwalker, you know, something bad will happen, right? Nothing bad will happen if you wake up the sleepwalker. The thing about 
waking them up is that it's pretty fruitless. It's really hard to wake up somebody who's having a night terror or is sleepwalking. So your best bet isn't to even try, but just to get them back into their room, make sure that they're safe and um, try and help them transition back into another stage of, of sleep. Um, try not to, you know, be the scary thing in their dream, you know what I mean? But um, waking them up is just kind of just pointless. All right, well, enough on those. Let's come back in the next segment and talk about why do we dream? Probably a pretty good question, right? Why do we dream?